All right. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. We're coming down to the close of this book. And in fact, it's the close of all written revelation that God has made. And we'll not see or hear any more until we see Jesus. You get down to the last verse of the book of Revelation, that's it. No more, no more, no more written revelation. Now you say, uh, uh, how about the Book of Mormon? Well, one theologian said the, book, the angel Moroni gave, uh, <laughs> the angel, uh, how did he say it? The angel Moroni received a lot of baloney uh, from, uh, from the devil because if there ever was one that was that way, it was the devil. And, and uh, anyway, uh, there are other books. There are some translations that are biased in their, uh, in their, uh, to try to prove their point. For instance, the translation that was made by the founder of the Jehovah's Witness believed that, um, that he had new revelation, and so uh, he took what Bible we had and he changed it to make it uh, fit into what he believed. <laughs> and uh, uh, what do you call that? That's eisegesis. Eisegesis. That's looking at, that's making the Bible say something it really doesn't say. Like really over there in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 29. That uh, has nothing to do with the unsaved people. That has to do with all saved people, that God has a plan for all saved people. He doesn't say he had a plan for all the unsaved, that he's going to send them all to hell. He just, uh, he just said he had a plan for all the Christians. And so we just can't read into something that's not really there. And beginning with verse 6, and the Bible says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord of the, of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which should much, must shortly uh, be done. Behold, I come quickly. And evidently, if you want to put this in your Bible, it's, uh, many believe that uh, when, he, when it says in verse 6, he said unto me, uh, someone uh, believes that's when the Lord Jesus starts speaking because if you'll notice, if you have the words of Jesus in red and verse, uh, verse 7, it's in red because it's Jesus speaking. Behold, I come quickly, and blessed is he that keepeth the words or the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things, and I, now John writes, as the Holy Spirit leads him. I saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard them, heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now, notice now he's worshiping at the feet of the angel, and I'm just wondering sometimes if, he's, if he is really worshiping the angel, but we get confirmation, of course, in the next passage, and he saith unto, unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him, let him be unjust, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works, so according to as, as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of, 
of uh, David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let us hear, he, uh, let him that heareth say, come. But let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. <coughs> For I testify. Unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Much is written here. <coughs> <coughs> we'll try to deal with it. It seems now that our study of the book of Revelation has taken us from the early church in the past all the way into eternity future. The apostle John has been a faithful eyewitness in fulfilling the divine purpose to what he wrote back in Revelation chapter 1 where he said, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which, gave, which God gave unto him to show his servants things which should shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it uh, by his angels unto his servants, John. Servant John, rather. John had been used of the Lord to reveal to God's people God's plan for the future. And as a young preacher... Uh, I went to my pastor and I asked him because I had been doing devotions in the book of Revelation and I had no idea what was going on here. It just, uh, the only thing it did to me was scare me. I couldn't, in, I couldn't understand it. I said to him, <coughs> and of course him being more likely an amillennialist, I said, uh, can you, do you understand the book of Revelation? And he kind of looked at me quickly and he said, uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, don't ever preach from that book. It's a closed book. And uh, the only verse that I use uh, is in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And, and I preach an evangelistic sermon from that. So I went away a little disappointed because... I really thought, and I didn't have too uh, kind of green, I uh, said, boy, if it's a, a revelation, it ought to be, a, we ought to be able to interpret it. Well, I got in Bible college, and my Bible college professor, the first semester, was a post-millennialist. And he was probably in his late 80s and early 90s. In fact, he went to sleep one day, one time, just teaching his lesson. And he announced that he was going to retire. And so we students gave him a, a real great retirement uh, 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 supper and uh, well, uh, wished him on his way. And then they announced that there was a, a younger uh, man coming to, uh, to the college who had a, and the, they introduced him as someone who had a THD in, in the Bible and that he wrote his doctrinal thesis, a 397 page doctrinal thesis on the progressive parallelism in the book of Revelation. Uh, man, oh, I really look forward to that. Well, I enrolled for the summer semester, which started uh, the first week in June. And, uh, and he came in and introduced himself. And then he began to tell us where his position was on prophecy immediately because, of course, he had studied and prepared himself for that time. And when he went up to the board, and, of course, it was that day when we had chalk and erases, you know, you know those days? Any of you remember those? Well, anyway, he drew a line across the board and then he drew something down like that, and then he wrote eternity here. And then he outlined on that line the entire Bible all the way from creation to the new heaven and new earth. Well, it really fall. 
uh, creation. And it was such a blessing to me. It was the, and he named each one of those sections and he called himself a dispensationalist. And I couldn't even say the word. And, uh, and so I, I didn't know what it meant, but later on I found out exactly what it meant. It was a system by which we can interpret the word of God and understand it and rightly divide it. And since that time, well, he, I wanted to know more. And so when I got hungrier, and uh, he told me, he said, I tell you what you do, uh, you, um, you get a book, and uh, it's called Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin. Now, it costs $3.98 at the bookstore. And now it sells, the first edition sells for $750. And I don't have the first edition. I have a, a copy of the first edition. But, uh, but I, uh, then later on, of course, my wife and I married, and uh, I was pastor of a church in Louisiana, and I started teaching this on Sunday night, and people started coming. We had, uh, first night, we had three people in the Bible school, a Bible study on Sunday night, and when I left there, three years later, we were running about 100 uh, in that class, wanting to know the truth. And what I do is study it at Bible college and bring that home and share it with them. And, uh, and so anyway, um, I, when I, how I prepared for it was that uh, my wife got a job at the hospital working 3 to 11, and I was, I was out, of, out of school that summer, and so uh, in 1962, and so I, we had a little apartment, furnished apartment, um, it, was, it was a nice little thing, paying $36 a month for it, and, uh, and we had all the water we could drink and everything else, and after she cleaned all the roaches out, why, we, um, we, it was just a beautiful place to, and it had a living room and a big, large dining room, big bedroom, big kitchen, and um, on the second floor, and so I would take her to work at about 2.45, get back home at a little bit before 3, and I would lay down on the floor in the living room and open the dispensational truth, and I went from page to page with my Bible here and with, that, with those charts, and boy, did it ever re revolutionize my whole life. And then I began to understand that if you're going to approach a book and, and really understand a book in the Bible, you've got to understand what, what the book is is trying to convey, first of all. Look at it overall. And so when you look at the book of Revelation, you look at it, and you, you read in the first verse, it tells us exactly what, is, what the book is going to be all about. It's, all, it's going to be all about the revelation of Jesus Christ. So then, is it divided up? Yes. So I divided the book of Revelation into five different sections. And it always pictured the Lord Jesus and his activity. And so what we went through, as we've gone through the book of Revelation, we have used that, those five different divisions, and then we put things under there to make it all make sense. And so we uh, did it uh, using this chart here, and if you want to write it down, it's, uh, it's very important, and I think it'll help you to understand the book. First of all, if in uh, chapters 1, verse 1, ver all the way through, Chapter 3, verse 22, you have the Lord Jesus as the Lord in the midst of the church. And then when you get down to that verse, you don't see the word church again. Because in the next, uh, next, in the next chapter, we see the Lord Jesus as a lamb in the midst of his throne in chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 5, Verse 14, and then we come to the chapter 6, and everything changes. It changes from heaven to earth. And then we say, well, where's the Lord Jesus here? Well, he is a lion in the midst of judgment. Revelation chapters, and most of the book of the Revelation is made up of this. In fact, uh, the whole, uh, uh, well, I see about a, a 70, 80 percent of that chart is, is, uh, is, has to do with this, with this area. Chapter 6, verse 1, 
through chapter 19, verse 10, we see the Lord Jesus as a lion in the midst of judgment. And then we move on to chapter 19, verse 11. That's when the Lord Jesus is coming back to earth and, he, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. We identify him as a lover in the midst of a honeymoon all the way from 1911 to chapter, uh, tw uh, chapter 20, verse 15. And then the part that we are studying now is that from Revelation 21 and 22, uh, we see the Lord Jesus is identified in that, in that section as a light in the midst of his glory. So he's divided, the whole book of Revelation is divided into five sections. And when you do that and you put that up there and you put it in your Bible, then you can put everything in its place and everything begins to make sense. And so, now here in the text, we have arrived at the end of the book. And the verses for the text and following verses serve as the Lord's conclusion to the book of Revelation. So let's move slowly through these verses and bring them uh, to a close in our study of the book of Revelation. Final statements are always fascinating, aren't they? I remember as a 13-year-old boy on April the 11th, 1951, receiving the news that President Harry Truman had done something. How many of you would think what he did on April 11th, 1945? How many of you would like to take a stab at it? Well, here's what he did. He released Doug, General Douglas MacArthur from his command in Japan. How many of you are old enough to remember reading that or hearing it? I, I was 13 years old and I read it and uh, I saw it. And uh, I was saddened because every time I had heard the name General Douglas MacArthur, I always wanted to stand at attention and salute, didn't you? Uh, because I, he was one more great hero in my thinking. And so World War II uh, ended, I mean, rather, he got fired. And, and uh, some, we always had a, what was the joke that went around during those days? You heard it, remember, I'll, I'll share it with you. Why did President Truman fire General MacArthur? Well, the joke goes that he was listening to, Douglas, uh, to, uh, to Truman's daughter play the piano and he turned it off. Uh, now, Harry Truman's daughter was a pianist and that's the news that went around at that time, but that, that wasn't a reason. Well, uh, you, know what, you know why? Anybody know why he got fired? He wanted to take the atomic bomb and blow the fire out of North, North Korea and take over North Korea and make that country a country, and today it's split because of it. Well, we won't go into that. But anyway, they asked Douglas MacArthur to come to speak to a joint session of Congress on August 19, 1951, and just a few months after he got back to the States. He closed the message with these words. I am leaving my 52 years of military service. When I joined the army, even before the turn of the century, it was to the fulfillment of my boyish hopes and dreams. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plain of West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished, but I still remember the refrain of the most popular ballad of that day which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And like that old, the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military service and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty, duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. And then he said goodbye and he turned and walked away. His speech was even more profound given to the fact that the words were coming from the lips of an old soldier. An old soldier, uh, um, uh, 
a man who had given his life, and just a few months later, years later, rather, in, in, uh, on April the 5th, 1954, Douglas MacArthur passed away three years later. For a long time now, we've been studying and listening to an old soldier of the cross as he delivers message after message concerning the future. We have been studying his events as he was, is an eyewitness testimony of the end times and a man in his early 90s with just a few more years to live. The difference between uh, the speeches of the, of the statesman General MacArthur and John's message is that his message is not only inspiring, but it's inspirational. It is inspired. His words are not just the words of a hero vet veteran, but the very words of God delivered through him. I wish you folks could understand it clearly. That makes the Bible a different, a different uh, part of your life. You understand that this is God's final revelation written to man. And my, we ought to respect it. Dr. Lee Robinson said he, when he was a young preacher, he got into the car with an older preacher and he put his Bible down in the, beside him and he put something on top of it and the preacher told him, take that off of the Bible. You never put anything over the Bible. Never, never. And you know, I, I, when he told that, I got a conviction about it. I, I kind of, that's every time I think about putting something on my Bible, I would back off and, because uh, it's the very words of God. And as John begins to wrap up his inspired record in this chapter, the verses of the text form what we call, and some scholars call, an epilogue. In these verses, John will challenge us, invite us, and remind us, and warn us with powerful God-inspired words. Keep in mind that these are the closing words of God's inspired revelation. These are the last words from God recorded on earth until we shall one day see him face to face. And as we take our Bibles and study the, these last words, may we be challenged by them. And notice, if you will, and I did my best to try to put together an outline for this, for this portion of Scripture, but if you do have your notes there, would you please uh, open them up now? For a cause, first of all, if you look at chapter 22, verse 6, you'll see where uh, the Bible tells us in verses 6 through 10 what, what it says about the Scripture. The Scriptures are what they are because of God's miraculous power in human history. Its own testimony is that it is inspired. God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be what? Thoroughly furnished. They may be completely able to do what? In all things, able to do what God wants them to do, according to 2 Timothy 3.16. Look, first of all, I want you to notice the Scripture's accuracy here. In verse 6, the first part of it, he said, These sayings are faithful and true. Now, the word sayings comes from the Greek word, which means a statement of divine utterance. And they are faithful and true, assuring us that there has not been a single exaggeration in the entire book of, uh, of, of Revelation. Nor has there been a single falsehood. Every prophecy of this book will come to pass just exactly like God described it. At two times in the book, other than this time, the name faithful and true are names that are given to Jesus. That name declares him to be trustworthy and worthy of our faith and trust. And the Lord can be trusted. And when, when uh, he makes a statement, it's always the truth. He never did speak anything that wasn't the truth. And when he makes a promise, it'll come to pass. When he, if he issues a prophecy, 
It's going to take place. Amen? And that's, his, that's him, and that's his integrity. In fact, in Psalm 138, verse 2, the Bible says that, 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 uh, that God has magnified thy word above uh, um, all thy name. There are three miraculous statements about the truth of the Bible that cannot be said about any other book in the entire world. And I want you to write these things down because they're very important. First of all, there is no other book that is, that is supernatural like it, and it's supernatural, number one, because of its inspiration. <coughs> you said, well, preacher, how do you define inspiration? And by the way, let me insert this. I never opened a series of, of uh, lessons in seminary, and I taught 13 different courses in seminary when I taught at Temple Baptist Seminary. I never opened the, the session without using this session that I put in here in our notes. I wanted our men to understand about the fact that the Bible is the inspired word of God and it is a supernatural book. And so I would always give them the definition of inspiration. <coughs> How would you say that? Well, some would say, well, God breathed. Well, it's defined in my seminary professor helped along this way when he's when he give a definition it is the work of the Holy Spirit superintending he uses the word superintending in the minds and personalities of the scripture writers making their writings a record of divine revelation this is far beyond any use of a, a inspiration as a reference to human emotions or abilities. The Greek word <coughs> for inspiration is the Greek word theopnostos. Theopnostos means God breathed, inspired of God, coming out of the mouth of God. Therefore, to believe inspiration is to believe that the scriptures are from the well, the only term I can use is the term distillation of God. And it, the distillation of God's very breath as he spoke what they heard. Repeated references to the breath of God are allusion to in many areas in the area of his speaking voice. In fact, in Genesis, he created the world with what? The breath of his mouth. He spoke and it happened. And I remember listening with interest to uh, 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 Dr. Jeremiah when he was talking about when the Lord Jesus would return to earth and he would get uh, return to earth and at the Battle of Armageddon and how he would fight the Battle of Armageddon. And you know how he said he, how he would win the ba Battle of Armageddon? He, would, he said that God will just do this way. And it's so you believe God can do that? Yes. Everything that you see around here, it's created, all these things. He did it that way. Just it happened. Because he's God. Amen? Boy, we serve a great God, don't we? Ma, my, my, my. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and God said, Poof, let there be light. And what happened? They fought back. There was no light. No, the Bible says. Immediately life came. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 33, verse 6, and also down in verse 9, he said, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Just as the breath of God brought all energy, matter, and life into being, his spoken words were formulated by man upon whom he breathed in a written document called the scripture that you and I hold in our hands. In there, this, as once somebody said, in, in this is the mind of God, the way of salvation, and the revealed plan 
and will of God for time and eternity. Now, watch this. So it's divine in its initiation. It is divine when it started. Put that down. That's so important. And then secondly, the Bible is, is supernatural because of its preservation. Preservation. What does that mean? Well, again, that is the Spirit of God working and superintending in the hearts and minds and hands of the scriptural translators as well as the scripture text itself which guarantees the protection of the original message of the Bible. So, what we got here has been protected all through the years. For thousands and thousands of years, it's been protected, and you and I can believe it. And let me just uh, turn back here a little bit because I cut this out. Uh, this was sent to, for me from, from um, uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers' organization. Everybody in this audience ought to listen to Adrian Rogers. If you don't listen to him, you ought to. And listen to J. Vernon McGee and these guys like this. And then the Bible, he said, the Bible is not the book of the month. It is the book of the ages. It has survived and it's applicable. It is up to date. It is relevant. Why? Because Peter said, the word of God, the Lord endures forever. There is a life-changing power in this book. And he used the first person here and said, I have preached this book long enough to know it's not like any other book. We read other books, but this book reads us. God says his, it, his word is quick and powerful, and God says it is, it's not my word, and, and it's not my word like a you know, hammer that breaks a rock into pieces, as Jeremiah 23, 29 says, he, even the hardest rock will break. I've seen it happen and so many times. The Bible has real power. What kind of power? He said, it has a power to save the sinner. It has a power to break addiction. It has a power to bring humility to the proudest person. It has power to heal the broken heart uh, of, of your, and, and parts of your story. You want to be saved and you won't get anybody else saved apart from the word of God. The gospel is the dynamite of God that saves. And that makes it supernatural, doesn't it? You see, the devil in a translation of the Bible could easily have distorted the original scriptures, or even stolen them in any era of time since it was written. Man could not have lived long enough to be guardians of the scripture, nor have they ever had the power in themselves to counter it, counteract Satan's uh, attempts. And without God's protection and without God's power, it would have been hopeless and a very hopeless task to guard the scriptures through various translations and cultures and eras. Praise the Lord for the benefit of the Holy Spirit's continuing ministry to protect and clarify and keep pure the message of the, of the Bible once breathed upon the saints of old. The word of God in scripture is a miracle among us. And God is committed to its protection against all who will deny it. It doesn't make any difference where they are. God did not leave the care of his word in the hands of men alone. He protected it himself and the Holy Spirit did the protection. So it is not only divine in its initiation, it's a divine in its continuation. Then thirdly, here's a point, here's another point that makes the Bible supernatural and I mean unreal to all of us. What is we mean by illumination? Well, illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit of God upon the heart and mind and the preacher or the teacher and the student of God's word which discloses the inner teaching of the message of the Bible. We're not here tonight, we're here tonight listening to someone do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Make known the Bible. The same miracle is as real 
as a first and second miracle. Plainly speaking, the same Holy Spirit that breathed and presided over its preservation is now here to illuminate and make the Bible alive to every one of us. And unless and until a person has supernatural understanding of the scripture, he or she is left in mere what? We would call it moral intellect to discern God's message. He could read it, but it doesn't make sense. He who spoke it in the first time, however, is present to illuminate and give understanding beyond the border of just human intellect. And that's what some people read the Bible like they read Shakespeare. And they, that's how they understand it, only from an intellectual viewpoint. But the Bible is not meant to be done that way for the child of God. He needs to understand the inner teachings of God's Word, and only by the power of the Holy Spirit can he learn that. You can go to all the seminaries in the world and learn everything you can, but unless the Holy Spirit is present, it's tinkling cymbal and sounded brass. God may honor his word, but he may not honor the person who, who is doing it. You see, the tragedy of our day is the weak emphasis on this third and vital miracle. It is as if God miraculously spoke it, he miraculously preserved it, and he now has left the explanation and declaration of the scripture to the best of human minds and methods. Not so. When he, got, when he inspired it and preserved it, he didn't stop there. He is neither mute nor motionless when understanding the Bible. He still speaks through the word of God and will be heard by those who will read it and listen to it and hate it. And that's why this preacher cries out from the pulpit constantly, read your Bible every day, pray every day. Don't sit there and watch television and spend all your waste, all your time doing things like that. Take time first with the Word of God. And if you don't read it, shame on you. There are people all over the world that are so hungry for it till it's unreal. When I was in Bible college, I had a retired teacher teaching missions, and she was, had retired. Her name was Alma Jacobson. She went to the Congo in 1929 her, and as a single woman. She met her husband there, and they married. He died on the field. They lived there in the Congo. And they, of course, no electricity, not a, anything, lived uh, primitively. And he said, they said at night, the people would sit around the fire, set a fire, and people would stand, sit around it. And from it, they would read big portions of the Bible. And the government came in and decided they would, uh, they, they would check to see if these people could read. And so they handed the, them a book and some of them turned it upside down and read it upside down because they were the ones that sat across the fire from the Bible and it was, it, was, it was this way and so they learned to read it upside down. They were so hungry for the word of God. Are you that hungry for it? God help us in America. I believe that God's hand is, he pulled it off and he said, you, t you get rid of this. Okay, you invite me out, I'll go. You tell God to get out of your life, he'll, he'll get out. I mean, he's not gonna force himself on anybody. No sir, really. He's gonna, you, you're the one to make the decision about that, amen? And you have to make the decision whether you're gonna read and study it and heed it. So I would, if I were you, all of you here, knowing that how, knowing what, is coming and knowing the rapture and knowing that we are continually becoming government controlled and the government is going to be our God that the Antichrist is going to take over it we ought to learn this book, book so we'll know a little bit about it amen? amen I beg you to do it I plead with you to do it to get in it 
You say, well, first that means I have to go off to Bible college and seminary. It might mean it. But you don't have to. You can open it up and read it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. Amen? Yes, sir. So get at it. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit speaks through you if you're a born-again believer. He'll help you to understand the, the, the Bible. You know, we may learn the backgrounds and the original language and, 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 and uh, obey all the rules and, and learn all the sound hermeneutics of science interpretation and go off to college and get all of it behind us. But if we do not have the Holy Spirit of God touching our understanding, we will be barren. It is as we listen to him through his word, we will hear if we look to him we will see. My mother went to the fourth grade in school. My dad never went to school a day in his life. He could not read and write. He never had a driver's license. My mother never had a social security number. Kind of rule, right? <laughs> a little bit on the rules. But you know what she would do? Sit out at night with an old Bible, big Bible, and put us nine kids in the bed, light a lamp, and she'd start reading the Bible. She would, did not know punctuation at all. She just read the Bible. And here's what she said. Every time she opened the Bible. Now here's a woman, as far as I know, my mother was not saved at that time. She would take the Bible, and then she would look at us. And she would open the Bible and she would say, Now children, when I read from the Bible, it's just like God is talking to you. Theologian. When I got in seminary, I had to do a lot of critical reading. O.T. Allison, all of these fellows that believed in what is called the JEDP theory. Y'all don't know what that is. That's a Bellhausen hypothesis of the Pentateuch. Uh, it was some of these smart alecks came along and they got so smart that they believed that there were at least five writers of the first five books of the Bible. There was a J writer that wrote where the word Jehovah's mentioned. And there's an E writer that wrote where the word Elohim was written. And, and the, then the P writer was one that wrote, uh, wrote where, the, where they talked about the priestly functions. And there was a D writer that uh, talked about the law, De Deuteronomy. All four of them. And then in 621 BC, there was a redactor that came along and threw it all together. Isn't that interesting? If you're lost, you'll fall for that hook, line, sinker. And I, here I was, a dumb country boy, in seminary reading that, and I went to Dr. Aubrey Martin, <laughs> the blind man. I said, Doc, this required reading is running me crazy. I said, I'm, I'm reading all of these, these men who believe differently as far as inspiration is concerned. But you know what it kept coming back to me all the time? Was what Mama read. <laughs> What Mama said, when, when I read the Bible, it's just like God is talking to you. And Dr. Aubrey Martin said, Jim, all of those men are lost and on their way to hell. And I said, can you, he said, do you believe, do you know I can show you from Scripture? Do you remember when reading in the Bible where, where the rich man in hell was begging people to come? Right? Go back and tell his brothers about, about hell. Jesus closed that out by saying, if they read the Bible, he said, if they believed not Moses and his writings, what's the, what's the next part? How can they believe on me? For he wrote 
of me. That's what Jesus thought about those people. So folks, listen to me tonight. You accept this book as the inspired word of God and you reverence it and read it and make it important in your life. And why don't you do it? Is there anything, if this is what I've said it is, is there anything more important than this book? Is there? You know of anything right now on the face of the earth that's more important than this book right here? There's not one. And that's why he's closing out this writing of the greatest book in, in the New Testament, his final revelation, he's pleading with everybody to believe it and believe it to be the absolute inspired word of God. Amen. Let's stand for prayer.